Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 138, Ultralight, the best of the lightest games. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. So tonight, we have a question from one of our fantastic Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patrons. Donna is looking to discover some new ultralight games, and we've got some great suggestions for her. We follow that up with a review of my most recent super light gameplay, and that is a prototype of a game called Flicking Finches. We then stop off at the digital tabletop for an update on Rogue Book. Uh, this is now officially released with the, the public production version out there. And I've got to say the game changed a lot from the beta. So I think there's going to be quite a bit for us to cover there. Then we're going to wrap up with our usual weekend review. Uh, the big thing I'm going to be talking about there is my first thoughts on the game Guildmaster from Good Games Publishing. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a comment on our topic of roll and move games. Dian Li Zhang writes, I think it's easy to make a roll and move game quickly without thought to proper design. So there's just a whole lot of absolutely terrible roll and move games out there. And this taints the entire genre. Well, thanks Dian Li. Um, this also ties in with companies trying to cash in on a popular new thing, a hot movie or a TV series that's just launching. And back in the 70s and 80s, this happened so many times with every new movie that came out, every new TV series. While I gotta say things have improved, sadly you do still see this continue today with some licenses. Next up, a comment from a patron of the show, Kurt, Courtney Jackson, who was looking for board game tournament formats a few weeks back. He commented on that show to say, just got to listen to this one last night. Thank you for the insight and advice. Hopefully we can get everyone's schedules to line up to get this going. When we do, I'll be sure to add picks and results. Thanks again. I look forward to hearing about how that goes, Courtney. Um, I really do love the board game blitz format that we highlighted uh, during that show. And honestly, the way things are going, I'm thinking I might be able to squeeze one in before the end of the year, maybe tying it to our extra life efforts this year to give us a bit of a boost if we can't have a big gaming event. Well, next, a couple of comments on our space-based content, both the unboxing and the review. Mike Riley writes, I got space-based to the game table twice, and it was <laughs> well-received. The key feature is that the game keeps everyone involved in the game, no matter whose turn it is. Fun game and worth playing. And Fighting Kitchen commented, the size of the rulebook makes it look complex, but it's not. Well, thanks for both those comments. Um, I will say the rules aren't quite as simple as they seem. Now, they're not as intimidating as a 35-page rule book, but the charge cube rules really are fiddly. To me, that's what stops Space Base from being a great gateway game. Is that It puts it that step above even a light game, um, and definitely not ultra-light, like games we'll be talking about later tonight. Well, next, a couple of comments on our Magical Kitties Save the Day review. Tabletop ba patron... Brian Kurtz writes, we did character creation today, playing tomorrow. Your nice. review helped me a lot, like expected length of the library adventure. And Sean Drennan says, that looks awesome. I'll have to try that with my boys sometime. Well, thanks, Sean and Brian. Um, I love to see that our Magical Kitties content is inspiring people to try the game and helping out those who already had it. That's awesome. Finally, we've got a comment from Ed Healy on our Battle of Gog review. I wish Kickstarter would go back to the dream days, but I understand why it has effectively morphed into a pre-order system. So are you saying back the dream days? Right, back back dream, when you were yes. backing the dream. Go back to the back the dream days. Yes. So thanks for the comment, Ed. Um, that is one thing I do have to say about Battle of Gog is that this is one of those back the dream style Kickstarters. And probably, I would guess, five to eight years ago, done amazing, back when that's what Kickstarter was all about. This really is a single designer's dream that may or not be funded, and sadly right now it doesn't look like funding's in the cards. 
Now, there's still some time to check this one out. Um, as of the recording right now, I checked before going live on the 30th of June. The Kickstarter is about one quarter of the way funded and still has 14 days left to go. So it's not looking good, but it's still possible. What's really hurting right now is the shipping rates that have gone up for everyone in board game. Well, not even just the board game industry, but for everyone shipping anything being made in China right now. So that is hurting it. And getting the word out there about the game, right? This isn't a cool mini or not. It's not a fantasy flight game. It's not a big, well-known game. But it is one of those things where you are funding someone's dream if you do choose to support it. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One quick announcement before we move on to our main topic. I am pleased to announce we have launched out into space our next board game giveaway. With our last two giveaways being digital and the fact that things are starting to open up and physical in-person gaming may be back sooner rather than later, mm -hmm. we thought it was time to give away a physical game. And it's one of our current favorites. Game we reviewed just last week on the show and we published a written review earlier this week. A new and sealed copy of Space Base from AEG. We're offering up a copy of Space Base to one winner. This giveaway is open worldwide thanks to Brian Shane of the Northwest Historical Miniature Gaming Society who is sponsoring shipping for this giveaway. For those of you on the West Coast, the NHMGS Unfilade 2021 Gaming Convention is coming up in September. Enfilade is, Enfilade is the supreme or premier historical miniatures convention on the West Coast. It is hosted by the Northwest Historical Miniature Gaming Society, Society in Olympia, Washington. The con usually takes place over Memorial Day weekend, but for 2021, it has been rescheduled to Labor Day weekend. Check their homepage for more info. That's right. Thanks to Brian and the NHMGS being will willing to cover shipping. We're opening this one up to everyone worldwide. Anyone who wants to enter, feel free. So head over to the blog, find the giveaway post, and use the raffle copter widget to enter. Good luck. Now, for those of you who are here live, you've been here before, you know what's up, right? You might want to hang around and watch to the end of the show for a thank you code might get dropped in the chat at some point later in the show. Also, a quick reminder that all of our Hoto guests or higher Patreon patrons do get five bonus entries into every contest, including this one. Plus, we tend to like to drop a code in our newsletter, so make sure you sign up for that, too. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. Tonight, we've got a question from our latest Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron, Donna. Donna writes, Thanks for the great podcast. I found you through a link to your top 10 of 1,000 video and have been working my way through the back catalog since. My question is about ultralight games. So quick and easy to learn that you can bring them to grandma's house for a good time with multiple generations. Uno-like, perhaps. My favorite of these types of games is Over and Out. Dead easy and quick, so much fun in a group, everybody always wants to play multiple times. What tiny step up would be Quicks which plays so well no matter the size of the group, from two to a bunch. For the type of game I'm thinking of, the mechanic has to be minimal and easily grasped, preferably with instructions always right in front of you on the card or sheet. What ultralight games would you recommend for groups of mixed generations, kids all the way to seniors? Well, to start to say, I've, I'm impressed by anyone who's going through our back catalog. Uh, anyone else who just discovered us decides to do this, uh, this you brave fools, I suggest working backwards, right? Don't start at episode one, just so you don't get scared away by some of our earlier attempts at podcasting and audio issues and formatting issues. Next, thank you, Donna, both for the question and for supporting the show. Patrons like you help us keep doing this week after week. Thank you. Thanks. And I agree, old audio rarely holds up as well as other formats, but the content is still valuable. Now getting to the topic on hand, I feel I need to start by pointing out that this is not my area of expertise, at least not what I consider my area of expertise. In general, I prefer medium to heavy, mostly Euro style games. While I do enjoy lighter games from time to time and do tend to carry with me a number of filler games to any gaming event, I do usually shy away from the lightest of games. 
as a result of being part of this podcast, I must say my kids and I <laughs> are probably more towards the medium weight as well for the most part. So they do play some lighter fare with mom. Now, that's not to mean that we're passing judgment on lighter games. There's no place for lighter games. There is definitely a place for them. Ultra light games just aren't the kinds of games that usually appeal to me or the gamers I usually game with. Now, this is a great example of how not every game is for everyone and how awesome that is. Now, I do have a surprisingly high number of lighter games once I started digging, but we do have still have plenty to talk about. Now, where I think ultralight games are awesome is exactly where Donna, what Donna mentioned in her question, for getting people together of all different types of experience, levels, ages, and diverse groups of people together at a table playing games and having fun together. These are also great for any type of gathering or event where the goal is to socialize. You're not there to play games, you're there to have fun and chat and socialize and be with other people. And the games are just there to facilitate that interaction and not the focus of the event. That's often the case with a really light game that you don't need to focus on it and that it's perfect for those group gatherings as a result where people want to talk, eat, and socialize mm -hmm. and not get locked down into four hours of 4X gaming to ignore everyone else around them. Yes. So before we dive into games, I think we first need to sit down and define what we mean by ultralight games, at least for our list tonight. This isn't going to be a big debate like we had about train games or anything trying to define ultralight games. This is just to classify the games we're looking at tonight to kind of reduce the flood of different games here. Now, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Like, I, I honestly, I don't even think Board Game Geek has an ultralight category for us to look up. Now, what we could do, Board Game Geek does have, is a weight scale. And... I, it looks like a limit for lightweight or ultralight might be 1.5. At first, I was going to say 1, but I got to say, it seems like people rate even games that are considered dead simple closer to a 2, where 1s on their own seem to be saved for things like tic-tac-toe, win-lose banana, like games that are barely games. Lightness or weight in general is a really relative scale. So while Talisman may be heavy compared to tic-tac-toe, it's mm -hmm. laugh laughably light compared to, say, Starfleet Battle. Yes, and there's the whole fact that we are looking at Board Game Geek, which is generally a, a super user site, right? It's a, it's a place where gamers who are already into games go to talk about games. So their idea of what is light and heavy will have a lot of bias towards, oh, of course, Race of the Galaxy, that's a simple game because I play, um, I, whatever, a Twilight Imperium three times a night. That's all you do and you never sleep. So what I think we have to do, instead of looking just like, oh, 1.5, that's it, is to go a little more abstract. Because to me, ultralight means a game I can teach in about five minutes, and that can be easily understood by someone who's never played a hobby board game before. Now, what I don't think matters actually is time. Like, I don't think there has to be a filler game, for example, a topic we covered a couple weeks back. I think it's the difficulty in learning that's much more important. For example, you can play charades for hours, but that doesn't make it a heavier game because you can play it all night long. One feature many people use, at least to help in terms of weight, is size of rules. Mm -hmm. If you're able to fit your game's rules on a single sheet of paper or even less, it's probably pretty light. Now, that was something that Donna actually mentioned in her question as well. So that definitely does classify it. And I will admit that is not something I took into consideration when I built my list that we're going to get to a bit. I didn't think to even compare the different rule book sizes. So, all right, I, we don't quite want to go with the with the, the board game geek thing. So one of the things we've done in the past, right, is we sat down and we, we have a whole show on game weight you can listen to if you want. So you know what we mean when we're saying weight tonight. Um, we decided Race for the Galaxy was the median, the, the middle weight game, the perfect middle weight game. It's right in the middle of the scale. And last time we looked on Board Game Geek, and I didn't confirm today, sorry, is it was a 2.5 weight. So according to Board Game Geek scale, it was right in the middle. And we use Race for the Galaxy to determine if a game is light or heavy. I play this game. Is it easier to play and learn than Race for the Galaxy? Well, it's a lighter game. Is it harder to play and learn than, than Race for the Galaxy? Or does it make my brain burn more than Race for the Galaxy? Well, that's a heavier game. Now, for an ultralight game, I'm thinking the upper cap should be maybe Fox in the Forest or Codename. Those are the two games I'm thinking. Like, that just takes a, that step. To me, that's a light game. I'm not saying that those are huge, complex games, but ultralight would have to be simpler than those. What are you thinking for a baseline game to compare it to? 
Well, uh, with my with my gut and my noodling uh, with the BGG advanced search engine, uh, I found roughly uh, a, a hard upper limit would be one point five weight on Board Game Geek. Okay. So that is going to knock Fox in the Forest out of the running. Uh, right. Fox in the Forest comes in at a uh, one point five eight. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Code Names comes in at one point two eight. So it's safely. Uh, Safely comes in there, actually a little lower than the ca- than the uh, the upper limit of the category, but a, a decent reference. See, I'm thinking Code Names itself isn't ultra light, just from personal experience, because I have had that game fall completely flat and fail at a family gathering with my aunts and uncles due to them not getting the rules and not getting the concept. So, plus, the rule book is about 14 pages; it is not a one page rule book. So, taking that, if Code names is 1.28. I'm thinking our upper limit should then be 1.25 on board game geek. A small step below code names. So, so like code names is passed. So it has to be below code names on the weight scale to be considered for ultralight for tonight. Right. All right. So what I ended up doing for tonight's game recommendations is I went on board game geek. I filtered it by games I owned and games I rated, and then I sorted it by weight and went from there, starting at the lowest number and working up to 1.25. So unlike our usual list, when we do, the, usually we do game that recommendation lists are in no order. These are. These are in order of weight, at least according to Board Game Geek, starting with the lightest game, growing more difficult, more complex, heavier as we get down the list. Now, all of these games are still ultra light. None of these games would be, con- be considered heavy in any way or even medium weight. So we're going to work up from the lightest to the heaviest. So the first game I have on the list is Personal Preference. This is a great icebreaker game where you place four cards out on the table into four different zones and players then rank them in order of preference, from one to four. Then everyone else bets on what they think the other players guess. Now, the game mechanics are dead simple, but the main part of this game is learning about the other players and the inevitable discussion. That happens at the end of the round. Well, why'd you pick that? I can't believe that you put space flight over pizza. And well, don't you remember when I was a kid, I grew up, I wanted to be an astronaut. Those kind of conversations are what makes personal preference great. And yes, that is a super mass market game that you used to be able to buy at Kmart. I have no idea if it's still in print. There's a caveat for this entire list. I did not check to see if these games are in print. I apologize. If it's our usual track record, about half of them, you're not going to be able to get. And I apologize ahead of time. And also, for a game like this, you want to make sure you are aware of your family interactions. That kind of discussion at the end of the round might not be something your particular family does well with, but we leave that up to you and your decision because that game was personal preference. Next, I have a sushi-themed dexterity game called Maki Stack. Now, this has a unique twist compared to other dexterity games I own and have played by being team-based. Each round, your team's going to work together to stack sushi pieces, nice wooden, listen, dug like chunky sushi pieces, to match what's shown on a face-up card. Now, the trick is, some rounds, one player is blindfolded and their partner has to direct them. And in other rounds, players work together with each only being able to touch the pieces with one finger each. This is a great game for gamers of all ages, as long as they have steady hands. And that was Mackie Stack. Now, the games I've mentioned so far have been mostly kids' games, and a lot more games on this list will also be kids' games, or at least classified can be played with kids. Well, this next one is definitely not one of those. Uh, In Canada, this game is for ages 19+, plus, and in the United States, 21+, plus, and I think in Germany, 14+. plus. This is unlabeled the blind beer tasting game. This is a game I actually kickstarted because it combines two of my favorite things, board games and craft beer. And it's a game Deanna and I like to break out on date nights or whenever having a, a beer tasting. Why not gamify it? This is the a beer and pretzels game night perfect game. Like there's nothing better with a focus on the beer, of course. Each round players get a sample of a beer and they place a barrel on the board trying to identify the type of beer, the style, the alcohol value and other features of that beer. The more accurate you are, the more points you get. I've got a detailed review of this one out there on YouTube and the blog, if you're curious to know more, but we are big fans of Unlabeled. So a probably or possibly a great game for the aunts and uncles and grandma and grandpa, but not the one you want to bring out for the nieces and nephews. No. That was Unlabeled, the blind beer tasting game. So anyone who's listened to the show for over a year 
knows I had to include Go Cuckoo on this list. This is a very simple dexterity game that's kind of like the opposite of Kerplunk. It's, it's, you're assembling things instead of taking them apart. Players are drawing wooden sticks from a tube and using them to build a nest on top of the tube with the goal of placing all of their eggs into the nest. Originally released as an Easter game by Haba, this has proven to be hugely popular with everyone I've shown it to. Players of all experiences, ages, and like everyone who has tried this game has loved it. And that was Go Cuckoo. Now, a couple years back, Yellow put out what was meant to be a series of games based on classic retro 8-bit video games. This is called the 8-bit box. That was the first thing you would buy is the 8-bit box set, and it was the core set for the system that included three games. Now, two of those games can be pretty involved. One particular game called Pixoid, I think, is a great ultralight game. This is a board game version of Pac-Man, with one player controlling the hero and the other players playing ghosts. Players try to stay alive for as many rounds as possible, getting some bonus points by collecting energy cubes. Once you played, once everyone's played Pac-Man, sorry, Pixoid once, then the game ends and you see who scored the most. So that is a really neat game, though it might be a bit expensive to get just for the one game, but it is, I got to say, at bargain prices, to be honest. Unfortunately, the 8-Bit Box concept didn't seem to have actually taken off. And that was 8-Bit Box, specifically Pixoid. Next, I have Super Cats, which is a quick-playing card game played over two rounds where players take on the role of Sentai Cats. If you don't know what I mean by Sentai, I think Power Rangers. The Sentai Cats are trying to defeat the evil Robo Dog. This one is great for gamers of all ages and uses a simple mechanic of just holding up your hands, showing a number of fingers. I admit, when I saw this, I didn't expect much from this game, but we had a lot of fun with this, both with the kids and with the extended family. Yeah, this turned out to be a, a bit of a sleeper hit that we all sort of laughed at initially at the unboxing, but mm -hmm. it turned out to have some uh, table presence. And that was Super Cats. Next, I have Breakdancing Meeple. In this game, you get a set of six meeple, which you roll like dice, trying to match the patterns on various dance move cards. At the end of each round, you get to dra draft new moves and improve your repertoire. Dead simple with an amusing theme that features a new use for a traditional game component of Meeple. This was a game when I played it the first time, I was like, how did someone not put this game out yet? Like, why did it take so long for someone to have done this? Yeah, I, I suspect that uh, a lot of people sort of had this on their to-do list and just never crossed it off. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the rolling pig game has existed for, you know, yeah, past centuries. The Past the Pigs has existed for centuries, and this is just a modernized Meeple version of it, essentially. And that is Breakdancing Meeples. Next, I have the Penguin Flicking Game Ice Cool. You are penguins in a high school attempting to sneak out of class and grab some fish to snack on. Each round, one of the players takes on the role of Hall Monitor and is trying to catch the other player. Now, the best part about this game is that the penguins are weighted like Weeble Wobbles. People still know what Weeble Wobbles are, right? I, I don't even know if those still exist, but they're weighted at the bottom. They're definitely, they're bottom heavy and they're rounded on the bottom. And due to this, you can do some really interesting things with how you flick them, including making them jump over walls. Ice School is one of those games that tends to get people interested as long as they're all good for flicking. And if you check on TikTok, I happen to know there's at least one person out there who has done some amazing trick <laughs> shots on, uh, on Ice School. I mean, yeah, I'm going to have to search for that one on TikTok. I've been slowly collecting board game people over there. Next, I have the show, a game that somehow became patron of the show's Tori's favorite game. He was obsessed with this game as soon as I showed it to him. That is Rhino Hero. This is a stacking game based dexterity game meant for kids, but that I have had a ton of fun with with gamers of all ages. It combines the feel of building a card house, like card houses out of playing cards, with take that elements, like forcing your opponent to build twice in a row, or having to find, pick up, and move the surprisingly heavy Rhino, Me Rhino Hero Meeple that's going up your growing structure. And yes, I know there's also Rhino Hero Super Battle, and I still haven't had a chance to try that. So I'm sticking with just base Rhino Hero. And there's also an extra large version of the game. Yes. 
Yes, there is. <laughs> That was Rhino Hero. Now, a different type of stacking game is Animal Upon Animal from Haba. Each player starts with a set of wooden animals. Animal? That came out weird. Wooden animals. And there's an uneven crocodile in the center of the table. Roll the dice to see which animal you have to place and stack it on the crocodile or the existing animals. If any fall, you collect them all. First player to get rid of all their animals wins. Uh, interestingly, this is a game my kids got sick of quick. Like, I, I found other people who have it for their kids get sick of it quick. And the kids seem to get sick of it way earlier than the adults. Especially nights when there's adult beverages involved. I, I, I still, I've still never actually played Animal on Animal, and I don't think I could play it without cracking up as to the, the underlying adult message that could be seen from stacking Animal upon Animal. There is that. Now, the most horrific game on this list, something that, that people may debate isn't even a board game, but I'm sticking with it for now, is Lupin Louie. This game features a mechanical plane on a boom arm with a gimbal at the end. It's weighted that flies around the board in a clockwise fashion. Players each control a paddle that can flip Louie up into the air where he does various loop-to-loops and comes down somewhat unpredictably, with the goal being to get Louie to crash into your opponent's chicken tokens. This is such a silly and simple game, but I have seen players of all ages play for hours and hours. I have seen this set up at a six-hour game session, and it was played the entire time. Now, there is also a Star Wars re-theme of this called Loop and Chewy out there. I have heard the components aren't as good, and it only plays three players. So I haven't actually picked that one up, despite the obvious Star Wars love and Star Wars theme. And that was Loop and Louie. Next, the game all about making a psychic bond, medium. This party game is great at all player counts. It's great for a two-person date night or a duet night or a full party. Players each play a word card from their hand. Then they work together to guess the medium of those two words, a word that applies to both of the clue words. Now, if they both say their words simultaneously, and if they say the same word, they win and get some points. If they fail, they get to try again. But now they have to use the word they just said. You get a total of three tries before the game moves on to the next player, and you just play around until the deck of cards basically runs out. And that was Medium. Next, I have Dr. Eureka, a science-themed game that has players taking three test tubes filled with three different colors of balls. A card is flipped, showing a pattern. Players then have to pour the balls from one tube to the other attempting to be the first to match the pattern on the card. This is the whole, you have various waters and you're trying to, or the, the power toy that people had as a kid with three different pillars and trying to swap the order on them. It's a very traditional game done with some great physicality. First player to get their test tubes to look right wins the round, takes the card. First player to collect, I think it's three, but some set number of cards wins the game. Simple and fun and great for most ages. And that was Dr. Eureka. Now, my all-time favorite dexterity game is Hamster Roll. This features a rather large wooden wheel with a number of slats or spokes on it. Similar to Animal Upon Animal, players start with a set of matching wooden shapes, and the winner is the one to put the last, we success, the last shape successfully on the wheel. The placement rules in Hamster Roll add a real solid level of tactics and even a bit of strategy to this dexterity game. And that is also my favorite dexterity game, Hamster Roll. Next is the mind. Take a deck of cards numbered 1 to 100, give each player one card, now play them in order. Sounds easy, right? The thing is, players are not allowed to communicate in any way. If you manage to beat the first round, move on to a hand of two cards, and so on. It gets harder and harder, but thankfully you have things like extra lives where you can screw up a round and throwing knives to get you out of a bind. Guess it's a game. <laughs> and that was the mind. Next, uh, while going through this list on Board Game Geek, I saw Pictionary, I saw Win, Loser, Draw, and I saw a number of different draw and guess games. Personally, I didn't put any of those on the list because of Telestration. This is Eat Poop, You Cat, or the telephone game with drawing. You get a clue, you draw that clue, 
Then you pass your book to the left. That person looks at what you drew, flips the page, and writes down what they saw. Then they close the book and they pass it. Then the next person gets it. They have something written down. They try to draw it. You keep doing that until the book gets back to you. And you will be shocked by just how far away that final drawing or guess will be from your original clue. This is one of the most fun games I have honestly ever played in my life. Like, Telestrations is a brilliant piece of design. Yes, I get that it's just modifying an, an existing common game that everyone supposedly played, but it just works so well. Though, you probably want to toss out the scoring rules. They're kind of silly. Just play as many rounds until you're sick of it or someone's thrown up their McDonald's from laughing so hard. And that was Telestrations. McDonald's not included. Yes. Hey, there's more. The game. This is a pitched-based card game where players are given an item and a feature of that item and have to give a Ronco-style pitch about that combo. But then, halfway through their pitch, they say, but wait, there's more, and flip over a new feature, which they have to include in their pitch. This is by far the best pitching game I've played, completely destroying all other games of its type. Now, sadly, this one I do know is long out of print, um, it's put out by the Bamboozle Brothers, Jay and Sen, and I've been begging them to bring it back. And every time I do, they go, hey, give it us a publisher. We would love to bring it back. So publishers, pick up this game. It's amazing. We'll help advocate it. And that was, but wait, there's more. Next is Ratuki. This is a classic card game recently reprinted by the Op or USAopoly. Players play cards from their hands, trying to make stacks of cards that start at one, with each subsequent card going either up or down by one number. When you're able to play a five on a stack, you shout Ratuki and claim that stack. At the end of each round, you get points for the cards you gathered, but then lose points for any cards you didn't get played. And that was Ratuki. Next, I have Rumble in the Dungeon a game I haven't broken out in way too long, and that's just because we haven't had public play events. You make a dungeon out of tiles, put one character in each room, and a treasure test in the furthest room from the door. Each turn, players either move a character to a new room or have two characters in the same room fight, picking which one gets defeated. You can also try to bring the treasure chest with you and try to escape with it. You get points for being one of the last characters standing, and you get extra points if you get the treasure chest out. Now, the trick that makes this game work is the fact that no one knows which characters are played by which players. That's all hidden information designed at the beginning of the game. This is one of the fastest and lightest games that I break out regularly. I break this out at home as an icebreaker at the beginning of an event or we're waiting for things to wrap up. And it's also great for public play events and can play a huge player count, I think all the way up to 10. This, this is a great one. And this is, or this was, Rumble in the Dungeon. Now, of course, I had to put Pitch Car on the list tonight, though I don't know if I, a Pitch Car doesn't feel ultra light to me, though I guess the, the basic mechanics of Flick Car are definitely pretty simple. The crash mechanics a little harder. Um, actually, there's a surprising number of dexterity games on the list, so which was part of what made it so long. But board game geek users tend to think, hey, it's a dexterity game, it's a one. I don't know. I've talked about Pitch Car a million times. It's a racing game with a modular wooden track that features wooden crokinole like cars that you flick around trying to win the race. Uh, the great part about this game is somehow it just manages to keep everyone engaged. You want to see how well your opponents flick and if they make that jump. Even in, when it's not your turn, you're excited to see the outcome. And it's also a game that never manages to not get a crowd of people watching. And that was Pitch Car. Next, I have a push your luck bluffing game featuring coaster like cards, which is skull or skull and roses or roses. The currently produced version is called skull. Players arrange their stack of cards, which consist of a number of flowers and one skull in any order face down, so no one else can see it. Then players take turns bidding how many cards they can flip before revealing a skull. Well, I can flip four, I can flip five, I can flip six, well, I'll flip eight until the bidding's done. And then that person is going to flip that many cards, picking who to flip in whatever order they want. So, Sean, you flip yours, then D, then Mo. Mo, you flip two, then you flip one. If they get a skull before they hit their, their bid amount, they bust, losing one of their tiles. When you're finally out of tiles, you're out of the game. Now, the first player to win two rounds of the game, two rounds, not necessarily in a row, wins the game. This is a great game for large groups 
Very simple, great drinking game as it uses coasters, though you probably don't want to use the one you purchased. But if you do have a coaster collection, as long as everyone has three identical coasters and one that sits out different, it, you can do it. Plus, you can literally play any number of players as long as you have enough coasters to play, which is one of the reasons you might want to pick up Skulls, Roses, and Skull and Roses just to have a bunch of different safe coasters. And that was Skull. Next, I have a very simple tile laying game about building monsters called Monster Factory. This is a fantastic gateway to other tile laying and matching games, specifically of the type where the sides of the tiles have to match, like Carcassonne or um, Isle of Sky. This is, I would say, easier to learn than dominoes because you don't actually have to count. My kids love the silly looking monsters you make with this game. But there's actually enough depth here to keep actual gamers involved, mostly based on the rules for creating minions and eye-based scoring. And trust me, that makes it sound way more complicated than it is. This game is I break it out for adults anytime we're around the Halloween season, but my kids play it regularly. And that was Monster Factory. Now, speaking of dominoes, that leads me to King Domino. This is a domino drafting game where each tile features up to two different terrain types. You are building your fantasy kingdom, trying to connect similar train types to each other, and trying to make sure to tie in some crown tiles, which are going to multiply your score the more you have. This one, like King Domino, shocked me for how much depth there was for such a simple to learn game. This was a game where I bought it at an Extra Life event, brought it to the table, read the rules, and was playing in five minutes, finished, sorry, I didn't buy it, sorry, finished my first game, I used a demo copy, then went, grabbed a copy, walked up to the counter, and bought a copy to bring home after my first play. King Domino is fantastic. And that was King Domino. Next, a truly classic mass market game that has been around for ages, Racco. This is one of those classics that's been around forever that I still love. One of the games I played when I was a kid. You start with a set of cards placed into a rack. The cards are numbered cards, and they're in random order. Each turn, you can replace one card in your rack with a newly drafted card, uh, either from the top of the deck or from the discard pile. So there is some strategy there with the end goal of having all your cards in numerical order by the end of the game. First person to do that wins, and there is a scoring system as well. I have enjoyed this game since playing with my parents, like like six, seven, eight years old, maybe younger. Uh, this is one my grandmother used to love that I would bring over to play at her house when she was still around. Like th this, I think, really fits Donna's question. And it's still readily available. And that was Racco. Next, I have Zuro, the game of the pack. You start with a really cool little piece representing a dragon on the edge of the board. Each round, you're going to play a tile from your hand. And every tile has multiple paths on it. So that every path goes out a different exit, that different side of the, the tile. With the goal being to stay alive as long as possible. Don't connect to a path that sends you off the end of the board and don't crash into other players' dragons while still trying to make your opponents do exactly that and end up off the board and crashing to each other. The last dragon standing wins. This is my go-to ultralight game to have at every gaming event just to keep people occupied while other games finish up or for waiting for things like food to show up. It's just one of those games I leave out on a table. Anyone who needs to play, I can teach them in probably under five minutes. Just walk up and like, you do this, do this, do this. Okay, I'm going to go back to my game. And that was Zuro. Now, if you want games that draw a crowd and get everyone at the table laughing, check out Cash and Guns. This is a game about thieves gathered after a big heist, deciding how to split the loot. You are looking at a Steve Buscemi movie right here, basically. A, a, a Coen Brothers, the end of a Coen Brothers movie, or Reservoir Dogs. Um, now, this game does feature pointing foam guns at other players, so that's not going to be for everyone because of that. And depending on how you're raising your kids, you may or may not want them playing with toy guns. But if you're cool with the theme, this standoff game can be a ton of fun. This is a take that, laugh out loud, making deals and breaking them kind of fast and furious game from Steve Jackson Games. And that is Cash and Guns. All right, it was a long list tonight, I know. Finally, I want to finish with Ticket to Ride New York. To me, the simplified version of Ticket to Ride is, is the very edge, like, like the very edge of what I'd consider ultralight. 
honestly, just because there's like it's not a one page rule book. There's enough little things with the routes to explain and and the way the the thing wipes if you get too many engines. It's probably just a bit over the fence. But I wanted to include it because this is my top. This is it. This is this is this is probably my favorite light game. Just getting off, starting the next category. This gives you all the feel of Ticket to Ride in a small box, easy to learn format that I find is really good for low player count. And that was Ticket to Ride New York. And supposedly London or Amsterdam should also fit this category. Those are the other city games that are supposed to be in the same thing. But I've only played New York. Now, I do have two honorable mentions tonight. Um, first off, I have to mention Oi, That's Me Leg. My Leg. I would say Me Leg, but the actual title is Oi, That's My Leg. Um, this is the lowest weight game I enjoy, based on Board Game Geek. When, when I sort by weight, it is rated a 1.0, and it was the first game that showed up on the list. And I'm like, oh, I got to mention that. So Oi, That's Me Leg, My Leg, sorry, is a game from Games Workshop. Yes, the, the Warhammer miniature people. It was part of a series of four kids games that they put out in the 80s with the premise that this was supposed to be something you give your kids to do to keep them busy while you played Warhammer, which I thought was pretty amusing. Now, each game included a tape, like a to put it in a tape deck music tape with trollish tunes on it uh, that we used to play while cruising downtown Windsor. Yeah, we were a little strange. It was that or anime soundtracks before people who knew what anime was. Uh, this is a rather fun roll and move game about collecting troll bits an attempt to make two complete trolls. Take that elements and all the stuff you'd expect for a roll and move, like skip a turn and all that. I actually reviewed this one and talked about the other games in the series on the blog. So if you are curious about the troll games from Games Workshop, check out the blog for that. Uh, we actually played some of the trollish tunes on, into one of the podcasts uh, early yes. on in our uh, early on in our series. But that was Oi, that's my leg. The other one that showed up on the list I decided I wanted to include, but it's not really a game on its own, is something called Start Player. This is a small box game published by Bezier Games that is meant to be a game you play before starting the main game. Playing Start Player replaces whatever silly Start Player rule exists in the game you're about to play. You draw a card from a deck that will have something on it like the first player to say the alphabet backwards or the first player to jump on one leg or the players with most buttons on their clothes goes first. In addition to that, every card has an arrow on it, so that there is a tie, you just look at where the arrow points. So it actually does, just in case it's like the tallest person, you're all the same height, or whoever's wearing blue and no one's wearing blue, it actually accounts for that. It also includes a nice, chunky, big, white start player meeple with a start player t-shirt on it, which is great if you play games that don't have their own start player token, which is something that I think every game should come with, as well as long as start player matters. Some games that matter, some it doesn't. Plus, there's an added rule in Start Player that if you ha currently have the token, you can't be the Start Player in the next game. So I, I dig this. I loved it. I brought this to every game night. It was my most played game on Board Game Geek for a while. And then, well, Schwazi came out. And that's just so much quicker and simpler. Except uh, there is that whole pandemic issue. So touching other people's phones is occasionally... There you go. Easy. Yeah, well, Start, start <laughs> Player, you probably still also have to take some cards out. Right. I remember one of them being something about putting something in your mouth. And I remember someone putting the start player in and, their mouth. And we'll just leave that there. That wraps <laughs> up our list of our favorite ultralight board games. Now, let's head over to the lobby and see if they have anything to add. All right, I got to say, there has been a ton of stuff flowing by, and I was trying to ignore it. So I, I was good, and I ignored the list. I, I admit, I, unfortunately, I, I have asked also and ignored the list. Uh, what I actually did while we were while we were chatting was I was massaging a board game geek search. Okay. Um, so I've gone into board game geek and done an advanced search, looking for things that uh, sort of match with what we've been talking about uh, when it comes to you know, ratings and 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 weights. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, board game geek tells me. The, the number one choice, of course, is Love Letter. Uh, followed... Love Letter is not ultra light to me. Yeah. It's light, but it's not. It's complicated. You got 18 different cards you have to learn, each but do their own thing. It requires reading comprehension. There's no way it's a one-page rule book. It's a 1.19. Uh, that, that's people hating on it and rating <laughs> it a one because they're like, oh, Love Letters are too light. That's all for people who only play Candy Crush. Uh, the next three, I think, are, are kind of obvious. King Domino, which we had on our yep. list. 
Sushi Go, which you don't have, so you didn't have in your list. Yes, I was going to um, Sushi Go, I almost put on for your sake. Yeah. I, I had it there, but we already had 29 <laughs> games. So I decided not to put it on the list. Yeah, uh, Skull, which you can, you had on yep. your list. Uh, Dixit Odyssey is the highest rated Dixit on the game, on the list. All of the Dixits would yeah, have been on this list, depending on how I sorted it. Uh, but Dixit Odyssey is the one that actually has been been, in, been out longest. I actually cut it off at 2010. So yep. some, the original Dixit, I think, is 2008, 2008. So. so Dixit Odyssey is somehow an update to Dixit. And I don't know what they changed. I loved Dixit when I first played it. And then I, I found it was too player dependent. And to be honest, I didn't put it on the list just because I'm like, eh, I, 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 we got the 29 games. There was stuff I had to cut. Uh, the one that's actually highest on the list, if I sort by uh, geek rating, is Just One from 2018. See, I, I want that. I want to try Just One. Just <laughs> One would probably should have been an honorable mention. Right. Just One is a party game where one person knows the, like, you're, you're, you got one person guessing. And they'll say, you know, a chocolate bar. And then everyone else has to write down a clue to try to get them to say chocolate bar. The thing is, if two of us write the same thing, they get canceled out. So if Sean wrote Nestle and I wrote Nestle, they, the, the clue hearer wouldn't hear Nestle, right? right. Like there's, there's a way that works. They're only allowed, each clue can only be in there once. That's the just one. And then, of course, depending on how much gets eliminated, they have to try to guess where. It sounds fantastic. I, I tried to figure out who was publishing and reach out to them. It didn't work. But yeah, that's one. I, I if the the pandemic didn't happen, I probably would have picked that up by now. And uh, the other three uh, no, notable mentions here are Clask, which is the magnet. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Oh yeah, that that was a Target exclusive, so I don't even know if you can get that in Canada. Oh, okay. Without like like you can get it on Amazon, but it's not cheap. Right. Uh, Point Salad. I have heard really good things about that. Have not tried it myself. And one I'm surprised didn't fall on your list: Junk Art. No, I, that's, again, that one's not light because there, you have to relearn how to play every round. Right. There's so many different stacking games. Like, that's like a 20-page rule book with all the different <laughs> ways to play. So, no, I, I saw it. So, okay, going to the chat, we got we got May is asking if concept is ultra light. I would say no. Concept is not easy to get the concept across. It takes way more than five minutes to teach. Right. That, it's close. It, it, it's up there. but And once you get it, yes. Like concepts of dead simple quick game, but they're like new people. You need to play with a bunch of existing people and have the new people watch for a couple rounds, and then they'll get it. And as she games points out, concept is a one point four. So there you go. Um, yeah. So Deanna agreed. Fox in the Forest should be light, not ultra light. Uh, Ryan's asking breakdancing meeples over Meeple Circus, but we don't think you've played Meeple Circus. Oh yeah, I, pl I played Meeple oh, okay. Circus. Completely different game. Like like not even at all similar. Oh, okay. Sorry, there the uses an app, and there's a time limit, and there's meeple involved. So I, I shouldn't say not at all similar. So breakdancing meeple, you have all the components in front of you, and then you have cards where you were trying to set things up a certain way, but there's no rolling of anything. So like you'll get a card that shows two meeples holding up a, a, a balance board. So you just have to take two meeples and set up a balance board, and then there's another one that shows like a clown on his head with a ball so if you manage to stack a meeple with the clown on its head with a ball you're going to get the points and then you get bonus points for how high you are so you might have put the two meeple together with the panel and then you might put the clown well if you can put that on top of each other you're going to get even more points and it's real time so there's music playing in the background and you're trying to get the stuff built and it's you're earning cards for matching patterns with the meeples but there's no roll them it's it's just it's a pure dexterity game with cute components and and really cute components like there's horses and elephants and all this stuff and then later you can get money to buy new elements. But that part I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't own the game. Uh, there was a demo copy at one of the local game stores, and I went to a demo night where someone taught me to play it. Uh, and Donna in the chat was mentioning uh, recommending Towers of Hanoi and Amsterdam. Why, why am I blanking on Amsterdam? Why do I, I know what that Towers of Hanoi I don't recognize off the top of my head? And Amsterdam, I am drawing a blank. Yes. So Deanna, Deanna notes, don't shout Robo Dog over and over when there is a dog in the room. We did learn that. Uh, Tech still hasn't gotten to play Go Cuckoo, which is just wrong. Yeah, Mo Me Meeple Circus is a neat game. It, I, there's no reason to buy it because Deanna wouldn't like it. And it, it just, I have other dexterity games. And yes, there are a lot of dexterity games, but again, I think that's because they're not really heavily complicated. 
So I'm wondering if this is the 1973 Amsterdam, which is a uh, move through the waterways. Uh, people love the mind, telestrations, telegrations, not fun with people who can actually draw. I, I don't, I disagree because you're passing. One person being able to actually draw does not ruin a game of telestrations to me. We, we have played with people who can draw. I, I personally have not found that. Maybe if everyone can draw, but part of it is the time limit, right? If you use a timer and make sure that people don't have a lot of time limit, you don't have enough time to draw well. Or, or you, I, start, I have drawing, not seen that you start drawing well and you end up getting caught because you've gone into too much detail and you've got you know gorgeous flowing hair, but you've missed all the details on the face that matter. There's a bunch and of And then then someone guesses head and shoulders yeah. because they <laughs> saw hair. Like I don't I haven't seen that impact. I'm not I'm not trying to discredit that you haven't seen that moon haw, but I just personally have not seen it. Anytime we play with people who can, I can actually draw, but I can't draw in telestrations. The other thing is you switch to the 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 non-mass market the version with the fatter markers, and that'll ruin anyone who can draw anyway. <laughs> well, and also the upside drawn variants uh can completely destroy anyone's hope no. of drawing anything. I, I that was on the list, like it was in the board game geek list for the right weight, and I'd skipped it. Um, so there she's saying do it. Minimal art skills that go to random. Sorry, I'm trying to go through quicker here. Merch is here. King Domino is the only of, thing Ryan's played. A lot of love for Racco. The people really love Racco. Oh, Racco's good. Like, like for great mass market, yeah, I see it now. So addictive. That was our favorite game. If we ever go to a, a, a um, what do you call it, White Elephant? A, a, you know, a Secret Santa kind of thing where you like have to put in a $10 gift yeah. and people randomize, we tend to go and pick up a copy of Racco from, you know, Walmart or wherever. Yeah. No thanks. Dead man's draw. So no thanks. No thanks. What what weight does Board Game Geek give no thanks? Uh, I'm wondering why that didn't... 1.14. Huh? Wow. So why? how would I miss that one? That's weird. That should have been on my list. No thanks is a great one. No thanks is a fantastic game. You get past a card, you either put a chip on it and keep passing it, or you have to take it and you get all the chips. You're going to score your cards and add them all up. But if you have a chain, so if you have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you'll actually only score the lowest number. And that's it. Like, that's the basic rules. I basically just taught it. Once you see it playing, it makes more sense because it's the whole the chip thing is a big deal, right? Like, is it worth taking so I can pass more later or do I not do it? And then there's something to do with points for that. Um, Dead Man's Draw is fantastic. Way too complicated. Way, way too complicated. It's almost up to medium weight because you have to remember what 11 different suits do. Dice Heist have not played. Age of War, uh, again, too complicated. I would go for Roll for it to replace that or King of the Dice. And those were both games I own that I chose not to put on the list because I don't think they're as good as the 29 games we did mention. And King Golden Fun Employed, I have not tried. Uh, Dead Man's Draw does come in over our limit. It's a 1.35. Yeah. Oh, so that should be like a 1.6, in my opinion. Llama Dice, Scape, Goat, Spies, and Skull. Uh, okay, there's no commas here, so I'm having a hard time here. Llama Dice, I know is a game. Never played it. Space Scape Ghost. Scape Scape Goat. Goat. Wow, I haven't played any of these games. Spire's End, nope. Skull, yes. Coyote, no. Fairy Tale. Fairy Tale, nope. Martian well, Dice. Well, Fairy Tale is Fairy Tale. No, Fairy Tale is a drafting game. Martian Dice, nope. No, yeah. wow. That is Here a list of games up. I have not played. Oh, wow. I'm impressed. That All doesn't right. happen often. I will copy that into the notes for you. Yeah, that's a good one. That's that's a good one to have. Martian Dice, they're okay. Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas is a little complicated. There's some things going on there that are a little harder to explain. I do like Las Vegas. Uh, Six Nimit, I've never played the Nimit game. Uh, you know what? I played Six Nimit on uh, uh, Board Game Geek or Board Game Arena quite a bit. My only concern is it could end up a little aggressive for a family thing. So, yes, I think it is an ultralight, but it may not be ideal for family. For family uh, so, Ryan agreed that Dick's it, maybe not. I think if it, it, it classified, I just didn't enjoy it enough. Yeah, that, that seems to be the thing. It, it, it hits all the marks, but it seems to be a real divisive game right you either love it or you hate yeah. it yeah math guy dave saying the same thing dix, dix is the least favorite of that type of game uh las Mysterium? vegas is a 1.19 what's that las vegas is a 1.19 all right fair enough i don't own it i didn't like it when i played it great dancing meeple or meeple yeah, service see, it's, it's cutthroat there we go that's uh yeah Don, donna's already already used to that one. Oh, okay oh ticket to ride amsterdam with... is what she was talking about oh ticket to ride amsterdam yeah okay that makes sense that's what, that's what happens when we get uh, out of... Hold Doc Mau Mau. I've, I've heard the name before. 
Mm. All right. Plus, we have some stuff here from the lobbyists. Uh, from sorry, from our Discord. So Niall, I know it, but I can't remember it. Telestrations we did have. Quirkle, uh, it's it, it's light. It's not ultra light. It close. I don't know. That, that if people played Scrabble, it's ultra light. So if you're sitting down with grandma and grandma knows how to score Scrabble, it's ultra light. But if they don't, the scoring in Quirkle is a little weird. Especially getting 12 points. Dungeon Mayhem, I have not played. Ku, no. No hidden trader game is ultra light. The, the whole fact you have to get that concept that one of the players is playing against everyone else, to me, puts that a, a step above ultra light for me. Uh, Danielle Sagrada, way too complex. Now, I will admit, when I asked this in the chat room, I didn't say ultra light. I just said favorite light games. I didn't want to totally give away our topic. So we're going to get some that are above. Gobblestones, I don't know. Um, Why do I know? Zero, yes. Well, I'm like, huh? I've, Gobblestone sounds familiar to me. What? That's, that's... I don't know that one. Uh, Dice Forge definitely a little bit above Flux. I I hate Flux. That's why it's not on my list. I have had some really bad experiences with Flux. Sushi Go, yes. In fighting, I have not played. Forty below. Zombie Dice. It's a little too hard to explain the different symbols and what you're trying to go for. I would say light. Um, Kin again, not quite light. Number nine. No, the scoring steward. The look down and count makes it a little bit above. Uh, New York Slice, just the scoring, just by having the anchovies score different from everything else, I think puts it to to light, not ultra light. Milborn, oh, it's been played so long that I want to say it's ultra light, but to be honest, there's some fiddly rules in there about restarting your car and the flat tires and screwing other players. I'm thinking more light than ultra light, though it's probably rated a one point something. So uh, Gobblestones is a is a tile placement. Um it's currently rated at 1.75, but that's only with four votes, so that means nothing. Yeah, that's <laughs> awfully high. That means nothing at all. I would say it is, it is probably a, a one, maybe a one three though. So I think I think it is just yeah, a hair what we above. We were looking for uh, just a hair above our our limit. All right, Jeff Seuss, Fox in the Forest. We already talked about Oni Thomas up there in the same thing. Parade, Dixit. Yeah, all these. I'll to be honest. All of these are in that just that step above. So he's got Fox in the Forest, Onitama, Parade, Dixit, Love Letter, Coup, Welcome to the Dungeon, Jaipur, Red 7. To me, that's all a step above. Then he throws in Unmatched to be light because the rule book's small and the rules are easy to see. And, and the one thing Sean mentioned it and I pointed out, I'm like, any game that has rules for line of sight does not fall into ultra light to me. And, and Unmatched, the original, the base game is coming in at a 2.0. Yeah, the, no way. That, that's not even close. Sorry, Jeff. Um... Raswell mentions uh, more flux. Cover your kingdom, which looked neat. Munchkin, no Munchkins. Too many fiddly, silly rules and rule arguments and card combo. King Domino for sure. Lost Cities. I was debating this one with D. I don't know. Is Lost Lost Cities to me the rules for doubling the whole? You can you can make the handshake deal. I forget what they're called before you go, which can double your score and the fact you have to card count. One point the, one point four nine. Yeah, see, it puts it yeah a bit above what we were going for. Uh, if we were doing the one point five, yes, but yeah. and then uh, Sushi Go and Marvel Flux again is also a one point five. Yeah, Marvel. Well, Borging he says Millboards does make it. See, I, I was. I, it has been so long since I've actually sat down and played Millboards that yeah. I don't know. I, I know you play these number cards, and then someone makes you plays a note of gas on you, and then you have to try to restart your car, and it's a race to some number. That's what I remember about Millboards. Uh, and then so very wrong about games. We've got all those because we need to look up those. You're not familiar with most of those. So yeah, there's a the whole time we already mentioned those. Yeah. Those were already yep. already in the chat. So um Gobblestone's really light. To win takes more. So yeah, that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Playing is just matching colors in the board like Scrabble, where the scoring is based on where you place your tiles. That sounds like it might put it up with the with a bit above with the quirkles, but I'm not positive. Yeah, like that. that's my feeling. Like it's it's light. It's absolutely light. Yeah, they're definitely but it light. It might be a one point I'm one point two eight or something. Yeah, it's, it's just above I think what we're feeling our cutoff is. Just numbered, you can place as many tiles you keep going based on matching. Even that, the you can place, but if you do this, you get the place twice. To me, puts it that that step above. It's that once you start putting in little exception based rules, yep. I think that puts it to the next level. Like I say, I think that went really well. I love the amount of suggestions we got. Mm -hmm. I love people jumping in into the chat to throw out things there. That was awesome. I hope, Donna, we got a bunch of games for you to check out in the future. Absolutely. 
Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to our review of a prototype copy of Flicking Finches. I want to start out by thanking Meriday Games for sending us a prototype of Flicking Finches to check out. Uh, Flicking Finches was designed by and features art from Eve's Tourney. Right now, the game only exists in prototype form, but Meriday Games hopes to have it published by 2022 through the help of Kickstarter. Now, a game of Flicking Finches takes about half an hour to play and take plays two to four players. As a disclaimer, we really don't recommend flicking real finches. They're quite pretty, and we don't support animal abuse. Flicking Finches is a flicking-based dexterity game set in the Galapagos Islands. Players play a flock of finches who are flying around the islands trying to catch the attention of Charles Darwin, hoping that they will get sketched into his sketchbook and get rewarded with some seeds. The trick is that Darwin is studying evolution, and he'll be looking for finches with different characteristics for his book. These include size, beak design, and feather pattern. The winner is the player controlling the flock that earns the most seeds by the end of the game. The version of Flicking Finches we're talking about today is a prototype copy. Due to this, we did not bother recording an unboxing video, and as usual with the, one of these previews, everything said here is subject to change. Now, in this case, though, unlike my review of Battle of Gog a couple weeks ago, the designer does consider this game to be finished and complete. Now, there is a chance something will come up during the Kickstarter or based on other feedback from other people doing previews right now. That's not expected. It's not expected anything that will change. Now, there are a couple changes planned, but they won't affect gameplay. One is to shrink the box down so it fits in your typical board game shelf something we've suggested before, and to change the color of the egg components. But other than that, everything should stay the same. No constantly interfacing with the designer on rule questions, then? No, we have been back and forth on a couple things that I did ask for clarification on, and a couple suggestions I had, which we'll actually get to when I get to my final thoughts. Now, despite being a prototype, the components in my copy of Flicking Finches are excellent. Like, I own published games that have worse components than this. Uh, the finches themselves are wooden discs with stickers on them in two different sizes and four different player colors. Uh, one of my suggestions being you might want to try more colorblind friendly colors. Darwin is a wooden pawn that looks like it's wearing a hat, just a, a round, not a meeple, but a pawn. Um, there are also four wooden egg tokens. Mine are in blue, but the final version will have these in the four player colors. Now, the sketchbook cards are pretty good quality. Now, the most impressive component by far in flicking finches is the play mat. This is a nice, thick neoprene mat that features the game board, as well as a rather detailed summary of play up in one corner. Everything on the mat is clear and easy to see, and the wooden discs slide well on it. Now, I haven't gotten my hands on this one, just seeing what everyone can on Board Game Geek. So how do you play this evolution-themed board game? So you place the play mat in the center of the table, shuffle the sketchbook cards, and flip up five of them. Each player takes all the finches in their chosen color. Eggs are placed by the side of the board. The player to the left of the start player, who Sean's going to hate because it's the last person to have fed a bird, sorry, Sean, picks one of their finches and hatches it. This is done by placing the finch disc on any one of the three nesting sites and giving it one flick. No, you're not really aiming for anything here because Darwin isn't placed yet. Now, the third and fourth player do the exact same, but hatch two finches. Once all the finches are hatched, then it gets back to the start player, who places the Darwin pawn on any of the eight observation spots and then takes their first turn. See, and this game was going so well, right up until the start player determination. <laughs> now, each player turn starts with you having the option to evolve one of your finches that are already in play. Each finch has three characteristics, size, beak shape, and color. And color actually here, or pattern, is striped or not. Now, to evolve, you remove a finch from the board and replace it with another finch that is only different from the original one in one aspect and one aspect only. Well, pretty questionable example of evolution, but no one said this was a STEM game. And actually, when we get to my final thoughts, there is a really good quote about this included in the game. Now, after potentially evolving a finch, you get three actions. The possible actions, which can be taken in any order or more than once, are evolve. This is the same as what I just described, but is in addition to the evolution you get for free at the start of the turn. Hatch, take a finch from your supply, put it on a nesting site, and flick it once. 
The nesting site used is based on where Darwin is, so you end up starting far away from him no matter what. Note you can also use an egg to get a free hatch action. As for how you get those, that'll be in a second. Fly, flick a finch that's on the board. Now, if you knock into Darwin, he gets upset and moves to the next observation site on the board. Bumping into other finches, though, is perfectly fine. Now, if you do manage to knock an opponent's fish off the, finch off the board from flicking, you return that finch back to the supply, but they get to take an egg. And again, eggs can be spent to take a free hatch action later. Now, if you do flick or knock off one of your own finches on the board, that's your bad. You just have to put it back into your supply and get no reward for that. Next is to chirp. You do this to get Darwin's attention. Each observation location on the board has a series of concentric rings around it. When you use the church chirp action, you first check to see if there are any finches in the ring. If there are none, Darwin hears the chirp but can't see any birds, so he moves to the next spot. If there are finches, Darwin will sketch the finch that is closest to him as long as it matches at least one characteristic shown on at least one of the face-up cards. The owner of that finch will then take it from the board and place it on one of the sketchbook cards, trying to match as many properties as possible. And again, there are three things, size, color, and pattern. Each sketchbook card can only hold one finch. Once all the Facebook's face up sketchbook cards are filled, a new set of five are drawn from the deck. Once the third set of cards are filled, 15 total, the game does end. No, despite the fact that chirping is how you want to get drawn, you may want to do this when there's no finches nearby just to move Darwin or to be nasty and get Darwin to sketch an opponent's bird that doesn't fit any of the currently face up cards well. So there's a number of different aspects of play here. Honestly, from the brief description of the game, I was expecting something quite a bit lighter than this. Mm -hmm. But this is more than just flick a bird meeple closer to the main meeple than everyone else. This isn't a game of horseshoes with birds. No. <laughs> no, it, it honestly sounded like it was going to be like curling when I first heard about it. There is definitely more going on. Now, the game ends when all 15 sketchbook cards have a finch on them. Now, note, if a player does run out of finches before this, their turns just skip. So everyone else keeps playing until all the cards are filled. Points are then rewarded for how many characteristics each finch matches to the card. One seed's rewarded for one match, three seeds for two matches, and five for perfectly matching the card. Player with the most seeds wins the game. I've not really hidden my general meh attitude towards flicking games, but I have to say I kind of want to try this one just to see if it can be as tactical as it seems. Now, in addition to these rules, there is an optional rule of adding clouds to the game. Now, the game comes with these three fairly large bubbly wooden clouds. When using this expansion, the first player, before anyone's hatched any finches, can place them anywhere on the board as long as they don't cover up a nesting site or observation area. So now that we know how to play, what are your thoughts on flicking finches? Well, I'm pretty sure fans of the show know how much I love dexterity games. I love games where you stack, balance, or flick things. It's this love of dexterity games that made me jump at a chance to check out flicking finches. And honestly, to try to help make this game a reality. Indeed, this is certainly a game fine-tuned for your preferences, even if the theme may not be something that really sucked you in at first. I gotta say, I like the premise. Like, I, I like the evolution theme. Like, it has come up before, right? That's what Dominant Species is all about, and well, there's a game from North Star Games called Evolution, all about evolution. And there's various versions of that with Ocean's Evolution and so on. But honestly, it's really not a common theme. And honestly, this is the first super easy gateway evolution themed game and it's also completely family friendly so this is the first evolution game for kids as far as i'm concerned and i gotta say i love this excerpt from the rule book that i kind of hinted at earlier important disclaimer evolution does not work in the manner presented in this game instead it is a lengthy process of diversification and selection that unfolds over many generations and does not entail quite as much flicking Gotta love a game that doesn't take itself too seriously. After all, this is a game, folks. Now, the theme is actually pretty well integrated into the game way in ways that just make sense. Like, to me, I just found it really simple to explain this game to the kids. I basically sat down and said, look, you want Darwin to notice you because he'll give you seeds, and you like seeds. Darwin is looking for specific things, though, and he'll give more seeds to birds he wants to draw. So you want to look at his sketchbook to see what he wants to draw and then try to get a bird that matches one of those sketches as close as possible to him and chirp to get noticed. 
but be careful not to hit him because that'll scare him off and he'll move to another point on the island. Right? That was basically my introduction of the game to the kids. Note to self, dive bombing scientist isn't a helpful trait for selection. Yes, which is why we no longer have any dive bombing finches left in the world today. Now, I've already mentioned how much I dig the playmat for this game. Now, in addition to being well-designed and practical, I love neoprene for flicking games. Like this style of game mat just works great because it provides some friction, but not too much. So it's unlike flicking on a wooden table where the dish just goes everywhere, but it's also not enough that you can't flick it and get it going. And I actually find neoprene really makes it easier to control your flicks after a little practice on the surface. Yeah, for people not used to flicking on neoprene, it will not, may not behave in the way you expect. Make sure you get the practice mm. in before you sit down and really start a game. Although this is the kind of game you play it and you practice in your first round and you get better at it. That's what my kids do. They, they, they admit they, they were not giving it enough. They, they were in the middle. They were either flick it all the way across the board or barely move it. But by the end of the second game we played, they were going pretty good. Like they, they, they had picked it up. Now, one of the things I do suggest, though, is to get that cloud expansion in play as soon as possible. Uh, if you played any games before, any flicking games, just throw them out there the first time. Because without the cloud, even at the maximum player count of four people, but even more so when you're only playing with two, the board's kind of empty. What this does is make the game in a way easier and in a way harder. In, in not good ways. Like, it's way easier to flick way too hard and end up off the map because there's nothing to get in the way. And on the opposite end, for an experienced flicker who's used to neoprene, it can be way too easy to reach Darwin in just one flick. Because again, there's nothing in the way. There's nothing to make it more difficult. Adding the clouds gives you something to run into, bounce off of, and you can do neat stuff like flick the clouds to move them, to cover up spots of the map or block access to Darwin or cover over a nest and things like that. It, adds a, it definitely adds a more tactical level to the game. So much like in pitch car, uh, when you've got a track without rails, you just need to be so much more careful when there's nothing you can hit to make mm -hmm. sure that flick is just perfect or it's gone. Now, my only complaint about this game really is in regard to the Finch images on the sketchbook card. Well, two of the characteristics that you're looking for in this game are really easy to tell apart at a glance. The pattern, which is striped or not, and the beak type, which is either thin and pointy or it's thick. The, that, that's easy. The problem is size can be hard to differentiate. The, the big isn't that much bigger than the small. And the other thing is, if you don't have anything to compare it to, it's almost impossible. So if you happen to draw five cards that are all small or five cards that are all big, or as you're playing, you're covering up one. So you've covered up all the big ones. It's really hard to tell if something's large or small. I, I do note that there are no images of the cards from the designer on the Board Game Geek page. So this may be something they're aware of and plan to fix before final release. I will admit I did bring it up to them. I did make a suggestion because they have a circle around them. And I suggested making the circle big or small. But they said then they tried that in playtesting. But players then thought only small birds could go on the small ones. And only big birds, excuse me, only small birds can go on the small ones, only big birds can go on the big. And again, you don't have to match all three of the things. You want to for the most points, but it made people think you couldn't, which is a bad part of the game. So I just think they need to shrink the small smaller and make the big bigger, in my opinion. But Now, another thing to be aware of, this is not a fault of the game. This is by design. This is a very light game. As I've already mentioned, this could be played by gamers of all ages. There, there isn't any reading required. And even the youngest of gamers should be able to flick a finch and can easily be helped with the rest of the rules. This was the problem my girls have with this game. Like, I thought they were going to love this. And after playing it, they were just, nah. Now, I have to admit, I introduced them to other games first. They played Pitch Car. But more importantly, a game called Flick Wars. This is a tactical miniature game that features flicking. This is something you can read about over on the blog or watch on YouTube. We've covered this. And they also played Rail Pass as a dexterity game where you're basically playing a sorting algorithm. And they just felt there wasn't enough going on in flicking finches to keep them interested. Like they said, it was fun. We, we play it again, but I'd rather play something else. I'd rather play something with more meat. They don't know the term meat. But they, they're like, I want to play something with more to it. Which is interesting. I mean, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say you're developing board game snobs. Uh, not yeah. at all. But at the same point, 
Uh, I'm actually interested in it because there is more than, say, ice cool, where you're yeah. just flicking a penguin around to a different room. Mm -hmm. There is strategy, and there is, you know, you're trying to make sure the, the most evolutions match and all that. Because, and that, that's what actually interests me, because there is more to it than yes. your bog standard flicking game. No, I gotta admit, I think it's really cool. I think this game's really neat and very well done, but uh, the kids is kind of the target market, and they didn't really take to it. So, right. I don't know. What what I'm thinking, though, is this is going to be a perfect gateway flicking game. If you are thinking of getting your family, your gamers, your kids, whatever, into playing more flicking games, do people do that? Like, I know people are strive to play an 18xx. Are people like, I want to get the pitch car? That's a, I don't know. But if it, it is, it's a gateway. It's a great way, because like this is especially like flick wars, like I said, which is a war game where you have units moving, you're attacking each other. I if I ever had to teach someone flick wars, I'd be like, here, play this first, and now we'll play flick wars because it just kind of gives you the, that mechanic. I think I think is it, this is good practice for games like Ice Cool and Pitch Car. So with some of the uh, cool Ice Cool TikToks out there, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if people gave up on that game, assuming it was already just for over that. <laughs> Those moves, you know how many takes they took to make some of those? Uh, 137, I believe, was the one. There you go. <laughs> See, that's just it, right? Yeah, you, if you can't pull it off every time, the game's not broke. Now, overall, I gotta say, I was really impressed by this. I, I, I'm smitten with it is almost a, a way to word it. Like, I, I love the theme of this game. I like the way it's integrated into game. But yes, I know it's not realistic, but the whole, oh, I want to evolve my Finch because he's looking to sketch one with a smaller beak, and the one I have out is a fat beak. I like that. And I like the whole flick and chirp and trying to chirp to to backstab my opponents. I think that's really neat. I, I like the way you're trying, and even the thing, like you're trying to get seeds, right? Like you're like, I got to look perfect for Darwin and I have to get close enough, but not too close. Because if I bump him, he gets scared. Uh, if this this very friendly theme and simple gameplay thing, I think this is a great family game, especially for families with younger kids that might even lead to a conversation about evolution. And 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 be a bit of a learning experience. Like, yes, no, it didn't quite work this way. But like when I learned, I learned about Titsi flies. The finch is evolving to have different beasts is way cooler than Titsi flies to me. With this, though, I can see the simplicity of this game turning off older gamers or more experienced gamers. Uh, while it's a lot of fun, there's really not a ton of strategy or tactics or depth of the game. I thought it was a quick, neat, fun game. I'm glad I got to check it out. And I wholeheartedly wish Meridian Games luck with their Kickstarter. Well, that's it for our look at Flicking Finches. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com and check out Flicking Finches when it goes live on Kickstarter. Welcome to the Bellhop's Digital Tabletop and a return to Rogue Book discussing the changes that have been made to the game now that it's released to the public. A big thanks again to NACOM and Ab Abracam, I think is how it's pronounced, for providing us with a Steam key to the public release version of Roadbook and as well as access to the pre-release beta uh, a little while back. Now, Roadbook, for those of you who don't recognize the name, is a digital deck building game from the team behind Feria and Richard Garfield, uh, the man behind Magic the Gathering, being his biggest card game fame, but also uh, Keyforge and a bunch of non-card games. Now, we originally took a look at Roadbook back in February, and at that time, we were looking at a closed beta version of the game. Now that the public release version of the game is live, I gotta say it's changed a lot. And I think most of it for the better, but not completely. So today, we're gonna sit down and take a look at a number of those changes and share our thoughts on whether we found them to be improvements or perhaps steps in the wrong direction. So there's been a, uh, any number of changes, but one of the big changes, and this is one I actually got involved on their Discord to complain about uh, and help drive more people, because I wasn't the only one complaining, but map movement. So the, uh, mm -hmm. as, you, as you move around, you click on hexes on the, on the screen to move from place to place. But yeah. in order to look around the map and see where things are or where you might want to move or where you've left something uh, previously, Originally, the only way to do that was with the arrow keys. So you had to either cross your hand over and reach, and you know, both hands over on that side to, to use mouse and uh, or whatever. And they didn't use WASD for movement. Uh, and so a significant number of people spoke up. And while it didn't happen on the initial release, 
uh, one of the first patches finally gave us the uh, WASD movement of the map, which is so much more comfortable and just ease of use. Be honest, I don't get this one at all. <laughs> I, I easily just take my hand off the mouse to my arrow keys and move them, or just click around the map and walk back over to the left and then over to the right. This, this one didn't bug me at all, but people seem to dig it, so sure, go for it. Uh, next up, uh, you noticed this one actually more before I did, was the completely revised starting deck. Yes, the the starting characters. Uh, well, for one, you don't even start with the same characters, so that was a little... But you start with the same two, right? Yes. No, when you first start, you only have you. Yeah. Not a second character? No, no, you get the, the first tutorial. The first, uh, no, it's the first two. It's the first two, yeah. yeah. So you only have the first two characters. And I started playing, and I was like, whoa, what's with all these companions? What's with this mounted card? Like, I... I far as i can tell these cards were in the game before but they changed which ones are unlocked at the beginning of the game especially with the defender character with this whole head banging thing like that was definitely not in the game before yeah I had like, the, like i don't even know where that came from yeah i still don't even use the head banging because it's 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 i find there are better uses for that character yeah. well the only thing good about it is it, it's all combo so they're free so you can do some interesting stuff with combos but yeah they they basically like here, we played a lot of rounds of the original Sean more than me and kind of got used to the different characters and how they play. And then they dumped on you a completely new game, it almost felt like. Like even though I was playing the same characters, you had to relearn how to play them completely. And I honestly, I'm, the more I play the new version, I think I prefer these decks. They just seem more useful and I feel like I'm getting a little further. So we'll bit more about that in a little bit. But the, that change was significant. It was just like, whoa, I don't even feel like I'm playing the same game. Yeah, I, I have to say the for anyone who played the um, the demo, which is what we got, uh, which is what you basically got in advance, uh, mm -hmm. they made significant changes to so many aspects of gameplay. While it looks the same, it yes. feels like a different game, uh, which is very a weird sort of uh, brain mix up because again, it looks exactly the same. They haven't changed any of the graphics, but right. everything you're doing is a little bit different yes like over overall so the the other thing too is there's a tutorial that didn't exist the onboarding i will say is way better now they they definitely walk you through how to play how the things work how to read your things there is way more information on screen now during a fight like when you mouse over and turn you're gonna see how much damage you're gonna take you don't have to do the math in your head you're gonna see if your shields are enough and it really walks you through from the start how to play, which is something that's often missing from betas. But it, I, I got to say the onboarding was way better in this version. Yeah, my my only concern is uh, some of the information is almost too much. Uh, like, for instance, that 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 mouse over at the end when you see what's going to happen uh, is really kind of a, a giveaway. I mean, it's nice for your for general players. But if you get into more advanced plays, it can actually be wrong. Uh, because oh. <laughs> you can have random things happen and you can have some so it's not even always right if you get into mm. the really more complex stuff because they literally can't pre-calculate certain things right. until it happens um and so there have been some complaints uh in the discord about that uh simply because when you get to that more advanced level it's not trustworthy anymore necessarily and you're gonna rely on that if you had that from the beginning yeah right which i which i can see being a problem yep so the demo, you can only play two characters, and that was it. You were stuck with the, the two starting characters. They have thrown in more characters, uh, a grand total of four, I think. Yeah. And, and now I think, I mean, these were always going to be coming. I don't think this yes. is anything we, new. we knew these were coming. Um, it's, it's odd. Um, the differences between them aren't as grand as I would like, I think, is the big problem. Um, two of them in particular seem somewhat overly defense-based um right. and and so yeah, you're, the other two are way attack based so yeah it's it's interesting because it's i'm I'm just I, I feel like i would like more of a difference between all four of them mm -hmm. uh rather than two attackers two defenders and there's your you know bob your uncle um i i would like a little more difference between them because right now it's not doing it for me so either give me more okay. more more companions or take the ones you've got and do more differentiation with See, what I found is it's almost like it's set up that you have to put them in set pairs. Like, like you have to take an attacker and a defender. Right. You 
take both defenders, you're not going to win, and take both attackers, you're not going to win. That's that's the feel I was getting that that I didn't enjoy. I'm like, why are you limiting my choices? The the all attack definitely did not seem to be working for me. Now maybe with more unlocks later in the game. Yeah, I haven't. I to be honest, I haven't really played any uh, unlocks because there's a, a particular player combo I enjoy, uh, right. which is an attack and a defend. Um, so maybe with more unlock cards, it would be more possible. I'd have to, I'd have right. to explore that more. But it does definitely lean you towards picking an attack and a defender. Yeah. All right, that's a, that's quite a bit of negative. So how about some nice stuff? My biggest complaint about Rogue Book before was that you, I never felt like I could do enough. I felt like you barely explored the map. They always put stuff off in the corners you couldn't reach. You could never get both of it. I always ended up having to leave a board feeling like I didn't finish it. They have fixed that, as far as I'm concerned. You explore way more of the map. Now, you don't see it all. And I'm, I'm kind of, that doesn't bother me. I can't explore the whole dungeon floor. That's fine. I now feel I can see enough of it. And the other thing is they put a lot more at the map at the beginning to give you a goal. So you're not just randomly using ink out some way. You're heading towards something. And there's a sense of accomplishment when you manage to get to the thing you've been trying to get to. And I got to say, the exploration, the use of ink, and the new inks, and the new distribution of ink, I think is way better. Uh, and on top of that, there's now a number of um, things you can purchase and artifacts you can find, which will reveal special items on the map to give you yeah. even more direction as you're exploring. So you really can leave a map feeling, for the most part, satisfied every once in a while they'll be like oh you know i wish i could grab a little more gold or you know oh i, I couldn't quite get to that one thing because i did you know the thief hit me on mm -hmm. one of my la on my last ink but oh, I hate that. <laughs> uh i've actually been i've actually been pretty lucky with the thief lately but uh every once in a while you know you just pure bad luck your mm -hmm. last ink is where the thief gets you and you can't chase him down yeah but you know that's that's gonna happen and but for the most part uh, they've given you both enough information and enough ability to explore, mm -hmm. which was definitely lacking in the original. Yeah, that, that is to me the biggest improvement. Now, added to that, there's a thing where the ink shows how much it reveals. Now, I think they might have fixed that in a previous patch before the release, but the original demo, I remember having my mouse over Spock went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And then moving to a one, two, three, four, five, six. I love not having to do that now. Okay, I, th I think that I might have got fixed yeah, earlier. I didn't, but... I didn't have that experience, so at least in the in the because uh, I didn't do the beta, I did the demo. Yeah, you did the pre-release, so yeah. I actually played in the beta. That was not did not exist, so that hurt. <laughs> right. I am so glad they fixed that. Though it does not only happen a little while ago. There's some odd changes too, where a lot more stuff you pick up now. So in the old game, if you passed over a heart, you had to use it right then. Both your heroes, hero ten. Now it's like a potion you can carry, but it takes up a spot where your ink would go. And that is a new balancing act that never existed in the old game. In the old game, I never ran out of inventory. Now, usually I have plenty of inventory and I'm not worried about running out, but it is an issue now. Like, like I have yeah. to use ink and I realize I have to use my hearts now because I want to pick something up. Now I've been, I've been generally playing without picking up hearts. So the last thing I do before I make a charge for the, the end is I will go and pick up the hearts so that I don't leave them there on my right. way out of the map. But generally i i have gotten to a point now where i don't really need hearts during the map so i just leave them there it's almost as if they need to come up with some sort of a mechanic so that i can be penal like the they could be eaten by some roaming monster or something uh right. because it seems almost unfair for me to be able to leave eight uh healing potions randomly around the map uh revealed and available to grab whenever i need uh it, it just seems a little unbalanced now to be able to do that as if they were part of my inventory. They're just out there. Cause you can't use them during a match. You can no. only use them between matches. So if I need healing, I just go pick up some of the ones I revealed. Uh, do they carry over to the next floor? They do. Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, ink and ink and hearts now both yeah, carry over. So that there. was a change. Well, as far as I can tell, it was a change. It's possible in the beta. I never had anything left. Well, no. Yeah. I mean, no one would ever go to a like go a to the new next floor with anything a, left. Yeah. Ink. Where I have, I have gone to the next floor with ink because it's like the one where it reveals one space. And I'm like, it's, I can't head to anything useful, so I save it for the next round. I've done it with a reveal three in a straight line. And I'm yeah. like, eh, that'll probably be more useful on the next map. And, I, and you can carry your hearts over. So the fact your inventory persists. 
may be a change, but it's a, it may or may not be a change, but it's something that now happens that I appreciate. Yep, absolutely. Now, along with the change of all the cards you can get, they completely change the economy of the game. Like, like completely. Like, the, the biggest change, I don't know. I don't even know what's the biggest change. If it was the, the redesigning of the cards and, the, and what heroes start with what. But the cost for everything is different. Absolutely everything. Like, the cost of draft cards was 45 I think, in the original game. Now it's, like, 25 yeah. Alchemy's half the price. Upgrades don't cost as much. There, there's you when you win a fight now, you get an option of taking an artifact or three set cards. Like there's just way more, way huge changes to the economy. Yeah, no, I. It was interesting because in the original uh, again demo that I played, you often had to be careful because you you'd find something and you couldn't afford it, so you need yes. to go run around and, and fight more in order to. Now, it's very rare that I haven't got, you know, all the money I could need, and I'm going, before I fight the big bad on that level, I'm going back to the store to make sure mm -hmm. I can buy all the cool stuff I want um, before I go up to the boss. And I've never, and the only time I run out, um, there are some advanced levels, which, uh, once you've beaten the game the first time, uh, give you challenges, basically. And one of them is, it increases the price of everything by 60%. Oof. Um, so, uh, but again, you know, even that level, I, I, it still didn't see, feel quite as bad as it had in the demo. Yeah. The, the demo you were scrounging, you were, you were scrounging for resources constantly, yep. hearts and money. And that, that seems to be gone somewhat. Yep. And then you mentioned the, the one thing that's probably worth bringing up that, um, the, with the economy changing, sorry, I just like mental block there. <laughs> And lost what i was gonna say so one of the things is there's so many cards now and you're getting so many cards unlocked and because you have the money to buy all this you have too many cards this is a deck builder and one of the features of many good deck building games is to be able to thin your deck yeah and there are on very very mm -hmm. rare occasions events that will let you take a card out but that's rare normally at best you're you're going to be able to change a card, so it goes from yeah, the something alchemist. weaker into something else. But yeah. you're still stuck with this increasingly thick deck of cards. I don't know. This game, I think Garfield did this on purpose. I think he wanted you to have fat decks because the entire leveling up system is based on how many cards you have in your deck, and the way you get unlock new abilities is by having so many cards in your deck. I, I think this one's by design, and I think that's going to be the big thing. The, the exploration aspect, but also that for, for the fans of these kinds of deck builders, I think that's going to be either a selling point or something that will make people not want this game. I think it's something that sets Roadbook aside. You are playing with fat decks. The, the goal of the game is to make your deck as thick as possible and still be effective. I think that's by design. And I see, I just feel like for an ex again, for experienced deck builders like myself, uh, while yes, you get a lot of benefits from having the bigger deck. There, it would be nice to be able to have that that trade off mm -hmm. that that question: Is it worth me getting rid of this card that's been annoying me, or should I keep it because I'm going to lose a power if I get rid of a deck? Right? If I'm going to drop right. down a level, uh, maybe. And and that that extra level of decision could make it a, a stronger game. But again, I'm not. <laughs> I yeah, hesitate see, to I, question. I, I still Garfield. think that I still think that's part of what makes Roadbook different from other. Right digital deck builders. I, th I think that's going to be a personal preference thing. So the, the thing I was thinking about, we were talking about cost. There are a lot more things you can do to affect that. So with the, with the scrolls, you can do things to affect the market prices, Yeah, which I found was a big change from the original game, which leads to the, the entire upgrading system has completely changed. Like there's a, a completely different tree that basically looks nothing like the one in the demo. And they have all completely different things on them. And wow, does it take a lot of scrolls to do anything on it? Now, but you get a lot more. Yeah. So, and, and and again, once you've beaten that game first, uh, and you get into this the, the the challenge mode, they call it New Run Plus. Um, these challenges give you ridiculous amounts of cards. Uh, I remember the first one I beat. Uh, I, I I think I had fifty seven. You mean, you mean scrolls? You scrolls, said cards. Sorry, sorry yeah. scrolls. I think I ended up with 57 scrolls or something like that because I beat, uh, you know, I had however many I got from the run. Plus they gave me a bonus of like 30 or 40 scrolls. 
just wow. for finishing that challenge. Yeah, which is a big change. Like before, this game was a, a run through a run fairly quick and maybe get one, two, or three scrolls and maybe even unlock something with those one, two, or three scrolls and then maybe do two runs and get a total like 10 and finally unlock something big. Now you're spending 15 to unlock something simple, like one more heart on the board. It, it, it's a very different feel for the progression. It seems less incremental. It's more big leaps. Well, it's, it's exponential. I mean, because it's, it's yeah. like five for the first heart, 15 for the second heart, and then probably 30 or something for the third heart. Yeah, it's, it's a very different feel because of that. Now, one of the things I thought was neat, actually, is the story is more integrated. When you get to the first boss fight on the first floor for the first time, until you've beaten it, you have a very set fight, which totally threw me off. I'm like, where's the randomness? I want to see different bosses, but it's a storyline reason. And if you beat that boss, spoiler, you unlock a new character to play, which I thought was a little cooler than the original game. Like, it, it gave me more of a feel that I was playing an adventure game and less of a roguelike, like, where it's completely random. So I did enjoy that touch. Unfortunately, uh, when you do beat the game, there are only three levels to the game. Yeah. Uh, and and it's not that hard to beat the game if you are a, you know, a skilled Slay the Spire or, or deck-building roguelike uh, type player. Um, you're going to beat it pretty easily. It, it really isn't all that hard. It'll take a few runs to figure out the, the balance and things. I, I admit I had the advantage of playing the demo a, a good number of times to get somewhat familiar to it. But you'll beat it. Uh, but the game isn't over, of course. <laughs> um, and I have to say, the way they did that was a little disappointing. Um, I'm, I'm glad the game wasn't over. You know, I, if, if it had ended, I would have been really upset about the amount of money I spent on this game. Uh, <laughs> and it turns out that there is vastly more gameplay than you, than you might think. But at the same time, the way they did it story-wise wasn't as cool as unlocking the first character on the first boss. See, I, I'll admit, I haven't gotten that far yet. So I, I can't <laughs> talk to that at this point. Now, there is a fourth character that can be unlocked, which, like, basically is so obscure that you need to Google it to figure out how to do it, which seems kind of silly to me. Yeah, you'll you'll trip across it, essentially. Uh, and all of a sudden, if you are paying attention, there will be a new character there. But they don't tell you there's a new character. If you do this thing in one of the levels... And, and and it's 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 a two step thing, then all of a sudden a new character will be on the map, somewhere there has never been a character before, and somewhere you have probably never looked before. Yeah. Uh, and and it turns out I was actually missing the character, the new character. I knew there was one coming. I just hadn't noticed it for several games. So yeah, that's a little weird. Yeah. Now all of this combines to have completely changed the feel of the game, especially for game time and difficulty like that is another aspect where i almost feel like i'm playing a different game because of all these things together it's a long game now and it's easy which is part of what makes it long no longer am i going in and possibly not even making it to the first end fight and then starting over with a couple more scrolls and making that inf incremental improvement and then doing that four times and then finally beating my first minor min or whatever major minion and then getting a couple more cards and unlocking, and then finally getting to fir fight the first boss fight. My first play, I beat the first boss. Like, my first play. Like, I hadn't done any deck building. Just with the stuff I found in my first play, I beat the first boss. I'll admit I didn't get through the second boss. That took a few more plays. But again, it took a few more plays. It didn't take 50 more plays. And that's kind of what I expect from a rogue builder, ro rogue-style game. And that seems to have been lost, but then replaced by a much more involved game which is much more long-term and much more engaging because you're going to be playing longer. And it, I don't know if this is good or bad. For me, it's bad for a reason I'll get into in my final thoughts, but I, I, it's just such a change. Yeah, it's the, the game now for me, again, I'm, I'm, I'm further on than Mo is at this point. The game for me is generally, all right, let's get all the stuff I can on the way to the third board and see if I get to the third board end game and whether or not I beat it. Uh, I will not always beat that third board end game, but the odds of me dying before I get to third board are pretty slim. I need to be taking a lot of risks and not, not paying attention for the most part mm -hmm. um, or for me to not get to the third board. And with the new exploration and the, and the ex 
the the expanded map uh, you get, it is a hunk of time. You're not yeah. playing this on your lunch break anymore. That is, at least, that honestly, my 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 main complaint. So overall, I like many, uh, probably most of these changes. Um, Sean so far sounded pretty negative, but I think he's still enjoying the game. Um, the thing I do dislike the most, though, is how much longer it takes to play. Like, like this used to be a filler. This was a game that I would play on a break. No, I don't have a standard day job with half-hour breaks, but in the middle of doing things, like, you know what, I'm going to take half-hour, 45-minute break, and I'm going to fire through a game of Roadbook, sometimes two in that amount of time. I would get a little further in the game. I would hope to get a couple scrolls. Maybe I'd unlock something new. Maybe I'd get one of those artifacts that carry over, and I'd probably discover something I hadn't seen before. Now I have a game I need to dedicate downtime to play it. Like I have to go, I'm going to sit down and play Roadbook now, or I'm going to sit just like I would be like, I'm going to go sit and watch Netflix, or I'm going to sit and play XCOM. This is now a game where I need to dedicate time to it. Now, yes, I can play for half an hour and come back to it later, but I just, I don't want to do that. I, I want to play through a full game. I don't want to forget where I was or what I was doing with my deck building or remember what I'd done in past games. And I, I don't know. Honestly, I haven't been and probably won't be playing Roadbook as often anymore due to this change. Like, I want to be able to jump in for a bit, do a quick run, earn a few things, start again on my next break, and just keep pound, pounding through it. Like, to me, that's what a rogue game is. A rogue like supposed to be like. While I get this new version is more immersive, you earn a lot more stuff each run, and you explore more areas. Just the time it takes to do that means I don't have the time to play the game as often. So, yeah, one of the things I'm finding is I, I really did enjoy the changes they made. I, I really was very positive on this game for the first while. Uh, but then once I, I got, I, I beat the game, you know, the initial uh, round of the game, and I got into the, what they call New Run Plus, um, it feels very grindy to me. Um, and the, the, the random nature uh, that's built into the game means a lot of times I'm playing, grinding, hoping to get that one card combination I know I will take to the end and beat the last guy with. And I don't always get it. And even though I've spent an hour and a half, two hours grinding through. It almost sounds like for your play experience, you should be able to start on floor three with a set of stuff. Um, like, like just having to play through one and two over again that you know you're going to win. And you're just going through the motions just to get to the actual challenge of three. It, yeah, I, it, it almost I, sounds like they could use a fast forward or something. I, I almost wish there were multiple saves. Uh, yeah. right, you can you can quit and, and say it'll save your position. But if there were multiples, I could go in, you know, play a level one and then go play a level two that I'd, you know, from from the one I beaten before and then go play a level three real you know, real quickly and have different experiences or, yeah. or you know, have, have different save points available to me. Because, uh, yeah, starting again, starting it from scratch every, every time, time, knowing that. I, I'm going to take an hour and a half to get to the end. I almost wonder if I shouldn't stop exploring and see, see how fast I can run it. But well, maybe, but again, then you're, then you don't build your deck. So you're not building your deck. Yeah. yeah. Cause you do, you start fresh. This is not like magic. You don't, you don't start with a better deck. All that you actually unlock is the ability to find cards later, which is actually something else we hadn't mentioned yet is in a way, the more cards you unlock, the more you water down your chances of getting that card you need. Is another aspect of the game that changed that I don't know if that's positive. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Now, for me, I, I still think it's a solid game. Uh, it's honestly still my favorite from this genre of digital deck builders. Though, overall, I, I want them to be fillers. I, I want to be able to throw it on my phone and play quick. This I don't have on my phone. I don't want to have to dedicate time to play. But I'm going to dedicate time to play this over the other ones I've tried. I'll still play this now and then. But, like, I used to play it all the time. Like, I would, I um, I already started some deals before I start working on the show notes for this week. Let's play a game of Rogue. I'll play through a round of Rogue. And I would sometimes play two or three in one day. That doesn't happen now. Now I'm at the point where I play, like, once a week, if that. Usually Sean will mention he's playing. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's something I can do when I finish what I'm working on. And I got to say, I'm kind of disappointed because I expected to play the heck out of this game. I expected to be, like, a new obsession. And, yes, it started like that for a bit. But it, it has worn off on me. Yeah, I'm finding I 
generally get, depending on my days, about one game in a day, uh, which is a significant drop from yeah. what I had been playing and what I expected to be playing once the full version became unlocked. Well, I think that's about it, unless you got any final thoughts or anything you want to share. No, that's all. All right, so that's it for our review of the public release version of Rogue Book. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, not a ton of gaming going on this past week for us, uh, mainly some games of flicking finches with the kids. Uh, game which I think I've already covered in and off in the review earlier. Uh, but I did sit down to a two-player game of Guildmaster with Deanna. Now that I do think is worth talking about. I've been doing a lot of digital gaming with Roguebook, but I also picked up a copy of Aeon's End and dipped my toe into that experience. Uh, I want to hear about that after I talk about Guildmaster. So Guildmaster is one of the games we got from Good Games Publishing. Thank you, Good Games Publishing. Um, they sent us to check it out along with Fairy Season Fun Fair and Unfair. Now we hammered out the Fairy Season review in record time, right? Got that was easy. I got to sit down with my kids. It was their kind of game. We played it. We played a bunch of games. We played I don't know how many, and it was nice and quick. And we got the review up. Solid game, very fast. A little too complicated to make our our, our ultra light game list tonight, but it's a nice solid light game with fantastic artwork. Then we moved on to Fun Fair, and same thing. It didn't take us long to get that one reviewed. It, it's nice and easy to teach. It's good to, um, it's our kids got it. We were able, and at the time, we were able to play that with extended family. So that went great. And then we moved on to Unfair. Now, we did play and talk about it a bit, but we still haven't done a detailed review. Because for one, I really feel we need to play this at higher player counts. We were playing that right when the lockdown started, and we quickly got limited to playing two-player only. And any take that game just isn't great with two-player. So. I want to try Unfair with more players, and I want to try more decks. And unfortunately, that's impossible due to the pandemic. We're loosening up, but we're not quite there yet. So next, I get to Guildmaster, and that is the problem. I can't play this game with more than two people right now. And I read the rules for the game, and I knew instantly that this is not going to be a good two-player game. So I've been putting off even trying the game. Like, there, the, I could tell it was going to be bad, right? So the thing is, it's not been a long time. Like, we got these games quite a long time ago. Uh, we were supposed to get them reviewed in a set time frame, and I had to apologize then. So I felt bad about not even talking about it. So I said to Deanna the other day, I'm like, we looked at our, our pile of obligation. We looked at stuff we need to get played. And we're like, you know what? That's been on the pile the longest. We really should give this a shot and at least start talking about the game a bit like we are now. Unfortunately, there aren't just one but several mechanisms that benefit from additional players. Yeah, and and I we should have held off. Like, I, I should have kept up with my, we'll wait till the pandemic's loosened up and we can pour, play for more players. That did not go well. Um, I was completely right in my assumption that this would not work good two players only. Because in Guildmaster, a theme, quick theme overview, you are running a fantasy adventures guild. Think Dungeon Dragons, right? You're hiring heroes, you're completing missions with those heroes and you're trying to improve your guild hall to be able to do more missions and hire more people and get more things done this is all done with mechanics that are very well tied to this theme and it works really well it integrates really well the problem is many of these mechanics are things that just don't work good with two people like first off you hire people when you're hiring an adventurer there's an auction they don't call it an auction but if two people try to hire the same hero the player who brings the most money wins that person and spends the gold. That's an auction. Auctions just don't work that well with only two players, especially because money is open. The first thing you do at the start of every round is announce how much money you have. So everyone's well aware of exactly how much you could bid. Next up, you have the completing of quests. When two players both attempt the same quest, you play a prisoner's dilemma, a literal prisoner's dilemma where you talk about what you're going to cooperate over, how you're going to split the goods, and then you throw down a token that says, I do it or I betray them. With two players, there is no reason to do this, right? That, that, like, it just doesn't work. Like, prisoners' dilemmas don't work. There's no reason to cooperate ever with two players. Then, when you complete a quest, most of the rewards are take that style rewards that are get this or penalize the opponent's guild. And while with two players, that, that, that opponent's guild is always the other player. You're just hammering on that same player over and over again. 
Yeah, it's it's a decent enough sounding game concept, but I do wish publishers would stop advertising player counts that don't work. Yeah, and I got to say it doesn't. Like all of this combined into a terrible runaway leader problem. Once one player gets some better heroes or completes a couple of quests due to lucky die rolls before the other player does, things just continue to ramp up because now that they've got more heroes and they've completed more quests, they now have more money so they can recruit more people to complete harder quests. And all those harder quests, every time they complete them, they're able to penalize the other player with the punitive actions. And the punitive actions get more as it scales up. Yeah. So before the comments fill up, I don't for a moment (laughs) doubt that there are solutions, house rules, and ways to fix this. But that's separate from a review, which should be about what's in the box. Yeah, I haven't looked any of that up. Like, and, and to be honest, before I get hate mail from Good Games Publishing fans, let me say the game looks good. Like, it looks solid. The mechanics all seem to work well. And I got to say, fit the theme. Like, it feels like I'm going to hire. And of course, if I'm going to hire a guy and I bring more money, he's going to go with me than he's going to go with my opponent, right? And when we get to go kill the owl bear together, we should have a discussion about, do we kill the owl bear? Do we work together? Do you want to try to trick the owl? Like, that all fits the theme really well. The components are also awesome, like really nice looking components, a nice long board. You got this like silk tassel thing to show when your turn's done. Really good. And the game is, 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 is looks fantastic. It just doesn't work well in a fun way at only two players. Yes, it works. Mechanically, it is sound. You can go through the motions. And I can totally see how all of my complaints with the game would be fixed by adding just one more player to the table and how they'd be even better with four players at the table. So don't take this as writing off Guildmaster. I'm not saying it's a terrible game. I'm just writing it off at two players. I have no interest in trying to fix this at two players. This is not a game for Deanna and I to sit down and play. This will be something to break out once we can get people together. All right, well, we already talked a lot about Roadbook, so I won't go on uh, Roadbook, so I won't go into that. But Aeon's End is certainly an interesting experience. I've only played the tutorial in one other game where I just randomized all the things. Uh, But it has caught my attention. Uh, My one complaint that I've got about it so far, and again, I'm I'm just dipping my toes in, is that uh, because I haven't played the physical game, the card colors and the iconography haven't been as obvious to me as I would like. Um, I found I was spending so much time hovering over things for tooltips onto what a card was actually going to do and it really made the game drag on um i think next playthrough i'm going to try and be a little bit more deliberate with what i start with uh rather than just doing all the uh the randomized everything and uh and and learning what the tutorial didn't get to because the tutorial basically just told me okay this is how you cast a spell this is how you use you get a gem and this is how you buy from the store and this is how turn order gets randomized but then it didn't go into what all the different things you can do are, what all the different spells and things are. Oh, because okay. again, there are so many. Uh, but I, maybe there's a you know a discussion somewhere in in help file of of the, all the iconography that I haven't seen yet. But it it was it's difficult, especially because when I randomized the market, uh, I got a whole set of different cards that I learned in the tutorial, mm-hmm. and I'm like, well, I now know what don't know what any of these cards do. Plus, there's that whole weird timing system with the portals and unlocking them and everything. Like, that's one of the funkiest things in Aeon's End. Besides besides that you don't shuffle your deck, that whole staging cards and is messed up. Yeah, I mean, the portal thing made sense, at least may, maybe it makes less sense physically than it does digitally. Because yeah. digitally, I actually got that pretty quickly. Um, and as soon as they said, you know, okay, you need to, you know, you're, you're going to flip your deck. And I'm like, okay, well, now I got to start thinking a lot about how I discard. Mm-hmm. And, oh, if I discarded these first last time, I want to discard these last yes, next time and, and, you know, get things lined up in the deck and all that. And that was, that's fine. I can, I can deal with that sort of stuff. But what I can't, what I was really struggling with was, okay, that's a fireball and a slash. And then I'm not sure what that symbol is, but, okay. oh, that means if, if I cast that card, I've got to, burn a health off somebody and and i mean the one thing i, I that shocked me um is how unbalanced the game is deliberately uh it's one of those deck builders where you aren't supposed to win easily at all <laughs> uh you're gonna die co-op 
you're gonna die and you're gonna lose your you know you're gonna you're gonna lose portals because you've died and and you need to keep fighting through and you're you, you know the bad guy has three times more health than your city does mm -hmm. and i like that i you know it's it's not a game where i'm gonna win this all the time um and that was fun so i you know again I've, i'm feeling good about it but i really do need to learn the iconography and, and get a better yeah. feel for what these cards are going to do and and how i should be buying cards yeah see and i'm playing my copy might not even help so like i said i have a first printing and they changed all the art and, art and iconography since then so right i don't think i could help you with that one all right well how about a look ahead what do you have planned for the coming week all right so as of today here in Windsor, we have open entered stage two of reopening. And also, as of today, I'm fully vaccinated. Now, Deanna just got her second dose of Pfizer this morning. So a return to in-person gaming is on the horizon. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, hopefully, even, like even the Delta variant seems like it's the people who have been immunized are, are in pretty good shape for it. Although it seems like Canada seems to have forgotten that kids 12 and under aren't vaccinated yet whenever they talk about how the percentage and we're perfectly fine. Only unvaccinated people are at risk and we've got a lot of kids, so we'll see. Uh, but we're getting there. We're really close. So with the things, the way things are today, we can also actually start gathering with extended family. So I'm hoping for a game night over at my in-laws again, something we haven't done. in I think a year at this point, but something we were doing at the start of the pandemic, which hopefully that can happen um, as early as this week. So this will get us a chance to finally get games like Guildmaster played properly with the, the right amount of players. And another one that's been on the pile way too long, sorry, CGE, is Trap Words. We have not had the people to be able to play Trap Words. So we can finally get to some of these games, obligation games. And as mentioned earlier in the chat room, it's also going to let us get back to topics like what are the best games to play on my lunch break at work and what are games for a library game night. We've had those built up for a year and a half. People have been asking us stuff and I'm like, I don't want to talk about how to run public play events when we can't have public play events. So that's another one. Um, the other thing I think we should probably do, we're getting to the end of the month. We should probably set up another patron game. And I'm thinking now that we know it exists, a five player game of space space on tabletop simulator, may be something we can set up. I'm hoping maybe to try to get that set up later this weekend. I know you're not free Sunday night, but maybe we can figure that out, but that's something we can talk about later. And uh, Sunday may be becoming more open. So we'll, we'll talk again. Yeah. Uh, all right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. And Sheehan, thank you and the Northwest Historical Miniature Gaming Society for your help with our current giveaway. David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Yuho Rutila. Thank you. Jeff Seuss. So how are you and Sheila doing on the vaccine? Is, is there a chance of in-person gaming coming up? Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you dig the content we've been putting out and would like to support our continued efforts and let us keep making this podcast once a week, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.